All right, I will start the YouTube live stream and we are good to go. All right. All right. Hi, and welcome to the next uh, webinar in our Plante webinar series. Uh, my name is Jason Padilla, and I'm your technical host for today's webinar. Next slide. This webinar is brought to you today by Plante, the open online community for plant scientists powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. Um, I would like to give a special thank you to all our AS ASPB members who are in attendance today. Um, your uh, membership dues help make this uh, webinar possible um, and uh, offered for free. Um, for any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today with a discount code percents 10 to receive a 10% off discount um, on your registration. Um, and ASPB uh, provides um, you access to this webinar and you can learn more about all ASPB's work at ASPB.org. Um, next slide. This webinar is recorded and will be made available on our uh, Plante YouTube channel. Um, we have a lot of awesome webinars in the past. So if you're looking for really insightful, really thoughtful, and really engaging webinar, you can catch our webinar recordings on our YouTube channel. Um, so be sure to check it out. And then, Next slide. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some um, housekeeping items um, to make sure that you get the most out of your experience for attending today's webinar. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, um, please let us know about those by emailing me at jpadilla at ASPB.org. Um, if you have questions for our awesome guest speakers, um, you can write them in the Q&A section of the Zoom um, portal. Um, we will get those answered during our Q&A. And if you are having um, trouble connecting with, um, um, with the webinar or need to leave the webinar early, as I shared, this is recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel. So don't worry, um, you could catch this again later. If you do have to leave or having technical difficulties, um, so you're you're not gonna miss out. And finally, without further ado, I'm now going to turn it over to our Plante fellows who are facilitating today's webinar. So take it away, um, our moderators. Okay, thank you, Jason, for your support. I'll take it from here to kick off the webinar. Hello and welcome to all plant to present celebrating women in plant sciences. We are thrilled to have you join us today for what promises to be an enlightening and inspiring discussion. The aim of the webinar is to shine a spotlight on uh, the uh, on the valuable uh, contributions made by women scientists uh, in plant science research, innovation and education through our insightful discussion with uh, three distinguished women scientists uh, and their shared experience, we aim to inspire and empower individuals from all the background to pursue career in STEM. Uh, today, we have the privilege to hear from our speakers and they will share their insights and experience in the field of plant science. I encourage all the participants to actively engage in the discussions, ask questions and share their thoughts throughout the webinar. <clears throat> So uh, this webinar will be featuring three women scientists, Dr. Thelma Madzima, Dr. Burju Alptikin, and Dr. Gitanzi Yadav. So this is the outline of today's webinar. We will be starting with talks by three scientists and followed by a 15 minutes question and answer session, and then followed by the concluding remarks. Allow me to uh, uh, introduce myself. I am Prakshi, a graduate student from National Institute of Plant Genome Research. Uh, 2022 Plante Fellow. Uh, Join me are Abira Sahul, uh, Sahu, a postdoc research associate from Michigan State University. 2024 Plante Fellow, Ellis Pierce, a graduate student from University of California, <clears throat> Davis, 2023 Plante Fellow, and Isabel Poche, graduate student from P Universidad Catolica D. Child, 2024 uh, Plante Fellow. So we will be moderating uh, the webinar and we will ensure the smooth flow of the webinar. So without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, start with the insightful discussion and 
contribution by with the women scientists so i have the privilege to introduce dr thelma medzima <clears throat> so dr proxy i think you universe yeah we can hear it fine now yeah okay so dr mazima holds prestigious position of associate professor of diversity and data sciences in department of plant biology at michigan state university she received her bachelor's uh, followed by doctoral degree in plant sciences from university of florida driven by her uh, upbringing in zimbabwe where she witnessed first hand the impact of drought on agriculture Uh, her research focuses on understanding epigenetic mechanism in crop plants her commitment to diversity and inclusion in stem is commendable and has been recognized through various awards including university of washington bothell school of stem inclusive service award and aspb excellence in diversity and inclusive inclusion award please join me in extending a warm welcome to professor thelma medzima as she shares her invaluable insights with us today Right, thank you for that introduction, Prakshi. Um, it's saying I can't share my screen while you're sharing yours. Okay, thank you, and I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you all for joining and thank you for that introduction. And thank you for um, this committee for inviting me to, to give my talk today. So um, my talk is actually gonna be somewhat of a very personal um, journey of my academic experiences. And so I would in summary, I would summarize my academic journey as a story that began with a sense of belonging and community and then a lack of after as I progressed. And so throughout time, throughout my education, um, I kind of compartmentalized my experiences as there was times when I felt like I belonged in, in, you know, in sciences and I was well represented. And the more I progressed without my career, um, I feel that, you know, there's a sense of being presumed incompetent and a huge sense of isolation. And so many of you will see me and some of the things that will stick out immediately is that I am black, um, I am a woman, I identify as a woman. Others might know that I'm an immigrant, like many of us, and I'm also cisgender, right? And so our identities are so complex, but they're not mutually exclusive. And the focus of my talk today is gonna to be my intersectional identity of being both a woman and a black woman in America and how that has impacted my academic journey. So I can't stamp my story without telling you about one of the biggest influences in my life. And this is my uh, maternal grandfather, Dr. Alec Matias Chibanguza. And he um, went to, he um, got his master's at Morningside College in Sioux City, Iowa and later on received an honorary doctorate from that university for his works. And I wanna highlight that he was doing his achievements, and, and this is a picture that I found on the internet um, of, a, of the yearbook, of one of his yearbook pictures. And so this is him highlighted here. And at the time the country of Zimbabwe was known as Southern Rhodesia. But I wanna highlight that he was doing the work that he was doing in and a colonialism and apartheid type system in what was known as Southern Rhodesia. And so no matter how hard he worked, the highest level a black man could have achieved during that time in, you know, in his field of education would have been a teacher and a principal. And so he did reach the highest levels. But his topic of study was actually, what is quite interesting to me is equal education for the girl child, right? And again, in this time, he had two, daughters and two sons. And this was a generation of time when very few people had um, opportunities for education. And usually it was the um, 
the male child who was sent to school while the female child was uh, the female children were kept home doing chores and everything but he defied those barriers by sending all his children to school and um you know and they all excelled and so i used to work with him like typing up his notes whenever he got a little bit too old and so i feel like that's when i started learning about my advocacy for those that are marginalized and also women in academia so really quickly i finished my k-12 through or my primary secondary which is equivalent to k-12 through in the u.s in zimbabwe Zimbabwe is a majority black country. We got independent in 1980, but we were not immune to racism and, and oppression of indigenous African people because there was still the lingering effects of British colonialism. And so I went to what, you know, we would say here are diverse schools, but remember this is a majority black country. And so we were still kind of, you know, about one third of the student population would be uh, black. And so this is me sitting right here in the front. But because I was in an environment where I was in a majority, I had a lot of confidence, right? And I always knew that I could succeed in science because why not? You know, doctors look like me, po senior politicians look like me. And so this is a picture my family really likes because it, it shows like how cheeky <laughs> I was even at such a young age. So then what did my academic journey look like? So after finishing my secondary education, I moved to the United States and I attended um, uh, undergraduate at Fort Valley State University, which is a historically black college and university, mostly black. And I thrived, right? And so I'm highlighting this in green because, excuse me, it was a time in my career when I was thriving, right? And I graduated summa cum laude. I had a great undergraduate mentor, Dr. Sawandia who, whenever I doubted myself, he would say, oh, when I said I can't do something, he would say, why not? And if I didn't have an answer, I'd have to proceed. I also did internships at you know, two universities. I did an internship at Caltech through the Minorities and Undergraduate Research Fellowship and the University of Florida, where they had a cohort of us from Fort Valley State University. And so the, both of those internship opportunities had community, right? Because it was still really well designed in that regard. And it was while I was doing this internship at University of Florida that Dr. Harry Klee said to me, you should go to grad school. And so I did. And I attended graduate school at the University of Florida. And because I thought I was doing well, I was thriving really well from undergrad. And because of my academic achievements, I did receive an alumni fellowship at the University of Florida. But this was my first time as you know, in uh, post-secondary ed education at a primarily white institution. And it was the first time where um, I started feeling the sense of isolation. And I was only black student within my program. Technically, I'm actually the only, the f uh, for a while. And then technically I'm, I was the first black student to <laughs> graduate um, from that program with a PhD, but you won't see that in records because I was still an international student. So I was, deemed international and not black. But my PhD advisor, including all the scientific skills that he taught me, he also taught me how to speak up and, you know, or encouraged me to speak up, which is something that I was also taught by my grandfather. So finishing my graduate degree, I went to Florida State University and in the lab of Dr. Karen McGinnis. And again, I was the only black postdoc in the department. But Karen had a really good skill of um, allowing me to pursue the DEI activities that I wanted to do because she knew how the lack of representation affected me and I did not want that for anybody else. And also she would also notice when I was, my performance was not consistent with my usual productivity. And those tended to be times when I was dealing with microaggressions. But one thing I always say is that Karen allowed me to be my authentic self. And that was actually really the first time in my academic journey, like since UF that I could actually feel like I could express who I was. So after um, uh, Fort Valley State, I went to um, the University of Washington. So around the time of finishing my postdoc and my first uh, few years at Washington, at University of Washington, I also became a, a permanent resident and uh, a citizen, right? And so that also kind of changed my academic trajectory as well, because 
I was no longer an international student and now I'm black or African American. And so I was in a tenure track professor position at the University of Washington in which I got tenured uh, and promoted in, in 2022. Um, and so my stories, are, a lot of my stories are actually going to be about my experiences at the University of Washington. Um, but during this time, I, like I said, I did get tenure and Black women make up only 2% of tenured faculty in the United States. And let that sink in, just 2% of tenured faculty in the United States are Black women. And we're considering all <laughs> degree fields right here, right? So we're talking about social sciences and you know, um, business and whatever. So, you know, in the plant sciences, it's actually much, 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 much lower. And of course, <laughs> I wouldn't have, my experiences were not so great at UW. And so I did move to Michigan State University, where I've been since mid-January of this year. And so nothing I'll be talking about was really associated with um, Michigan State University because I just recently joined here. So I don't have time to talk about my research program, but um, I just wanted to put in a plug here for my website for you to visit whenever you get a chance. And the overarching goal of my research program is to understand how epigenetic mechanisms facilitate growth, development, and response to ABOC stress in crop plants. And I will be hiring soon. I was hoping by now, but um, and then ads are not yet out, but please check back on the website and see how I apply. And please um, don't do that by email, just um, do by the formal application process. So what kind of obstacles and challenges does one face when you are in essence a unicorn, right? Part of like a 2%. One of the main challenges are microaggressions, right? Um, as a grad student, I was told you only got that fellowship because you're black, right? Regardless of my, um, SAT scores, my GPA, et cetera. Um, a colleague at the University of Washington Bothell said, oh, you must be adjunct, implying that a black female could not be a tenure track faculty member. Um, and even one of my division chairs at the University of Washington Bothell at one point said, I find it easier to say no to you than I can insert one male colleague's name, right? Um, and you know, this is another form of microaggression that we deal with. So. When I saw this website at the University of Washington Bothell, I sent a letter to the dean and the chairs, and I said, subject of the email was, are there too many, and I used the word two on purpose, the letter, the number two on purpose, are there too many Black females, female professors in our school of STEM? Because as you see here, this is a profile of my picture um, with somebody else's name. And yes, there were only two of us <laughs> in the School of STEM and, you know, they couldn't even identify us apart. And it doesn't matter how many Smiths they are, <laughs> how many Changs they are, um, they will be able to identify those apart. But when it came to Black women, um, we are not distinguishable. So some of the other experiences that I had when I was uh, assistant professor, uh, I had higher teaching loads amongst tenure track faculty in my division, lack of research space, higher service load, lower pay. And the problem with this is that all of these things affect everything that is required for academic success. Um, you know, they affect research productivity, funding, manuscripts, progress to promotion, raises that affect your merit-based raises that affect your lifetime income. And so I wanted to just show you a little bit of data about some of these inequities that I showed. So this is a petition I had to write, um, you know, for equitable, to petition for equitable teaching loads. And so I removed names for people's privacy, but this is the teaching load in um, what we call FTEs um, for tenure track faculty within the division. And names removed, the highest one here would be me. And just to normalize the data, it wasn't about the average number of courses people teaching, they were pretty much comparable. The lowest one would be the chair because they have course releases. So though we had comparable number of courses, they were giving me the higher teaching loads, right? And, you know, when I, you know, having to compute this data, you know, staying in the office late at night just to compute this data. When I saw the scene from picture of sci a scientist, when the lady, when one of the uh, 
female professors had to measure her lab space. I remember crying because I just felt like we never, we hadn't made any progress, right? You have to literally document the data to prove to them that there are inequities in the system. And so what other practices and cultures are causing marginalization of women and other uh, marginalized people? Um, so barriers that we face are like bias that impacts hiring, promotion, and funding, lack of representation, poor mentorship. And some of the mentors that are uh, assigned to us presume us to be incompetent anyway. We were excluded from collaborations pre-2020. And I highlighted these um, two points here because they actually are associated with what was actually going on at ASPB. Um, Black scientists were being excluded from conference presentations and excluded from journal, editorial, and review activities. Again, things that are required for promotion. I know they made changes since 2020, but historically, these are things that were going on within our society in itself. So, you know, as I wrap up, I was just thinking about different movies, you know, that have come out. And for example, Hidden Figures, where these Black female um, math mathematicians had severe obstacles just to be able to perform working at NASA. And if you remember some of, if you watch this movie, you remember some of the scenes where they had to go to different bathrooms way across campus within their short lunch break to be, and then be able to return. And this was set in 1961 or something. And I can't believe that it still feels like we're still going through the same challenges. And this is another really important review about what academia feels like for black women, indigenous women and other women of color where the uh, the challenge of reaching the success is you know built in is has inherent obstacles and paths that are stopping us from being successful right and so that is why so few of us make it to that tenure level or that senior rank level so one of my final thoughts here um you know as recent of 20 as recent as 2015 my own lived experiences are similar to those of women and black women that that experienced in the 1960s so there has been some change you know we're not going to bathrooms in different buildings but it's been really slow and so we cannot become complacent and it really is going to take everybody's efforts um, um i advise uh, my, my advice for especially um, black and indigenous academics is to build community and networks social media has really helped us connect and I know 2020 is still devastating in our minds and always will be, but one of the things that came out of the pandemic is that a lot of us learned how to connect online through Zoom, through social media. And these are things that we were only doing when we attended a conference, for example. And so we should take advantage of those networks and building that community of support. And also know your worth, you know, go where you're valued. And to be honest, it doesn't have to be in academia. I'm seeing a lot of early career um, black and indigenous academics who are actually leaving grad school and going into industry, do what works for you, right? There's not just one career path. And so because it is Women's um, History Month and we're celebrating women, I actually want to celebrate these black women in plant molecular biology who have paved the way for so many of us. If I were to tell you that these are the most senior ranked <laughs> black female professors in plant molecular biology, Right, and we know that there are thousands and thousands, you know, so these are people with full professor title and an associate member, but we know there are thousands and thousands of white male um, professors in plant molecular biology, and these are our most senior ranked black females. And I really admire these women because they have had to put up with a lot of challenges um, to get where they are and are there as a representation and a support system for many of us coming through. All right, and I will end it right there. Thank you very much, Dr. Madzima. That was a great talk, um, very enlightening. Um, with that, we will move to our second speaker uh, for this webinar. Uh, I'm very glad to introduce Dr. Burju Alptekin. She is a postdoctoral research associate at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She is originally from Istanbul, Turkey, where she got her bachelor's degree. 
Uh, and then in 2016, she moved to the US to pursue graduate school where she received her PhD in plant genetics from Montana State University in 2020. She uh, works on improvement of abiotic stress tolerance of modern day crops through omics, molecular genetics and beneficial plant microbe interactions. She is a first generation international woman in science and she's committed to increasing the representation of women in plant science. Along with her various DEI related activities at University of Wisconsin-Madison, she is also an early career representative at the Women in Plant Science Committee at ASPB. Uh, with that, uh, take it away, Dr. Arctikin. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for this introduction and thank you very much for inviting me here and uh, being involved in this event that we are celebrating diverse women scientists. That's really important to me. So today I want to um, start my talk by introducing you this success, this iceberg illusion. Maybe some of you are familiar with this, maybe not. What is it essentially means that success is an iceberg. So when we look at someone, when we look at their CVs, when we look at their like achievements, their papers, what we see is the tip of the iceberg. But there is also a hidden part of the iceberg. Maybe they like did a lot of experiments, they failed and like they put a lot of hard work. But today I actually want to tell you that the hidden part of the iceberg is actually more complicated. And I often think about my own iceberg. At the tip, I look like a plant biologist and molecular geneticist. But at the hidden part of the iceberg, I'm a first generation international woman in science. And my early experiences in life and being a first generation and being a woman in science really uh, affects the, the tip of the success and what it looks like. Uh, maybe it's not have to be like that for everyone, but I think generally our initial conditionings in life and where we come from really affects what the top looks like. And today I will mostly talk about the hidden part of my journey. But before jumping into that, I want to briefly mention my about my research. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Wisconsin-Medicine, and my main research interest is understanding uh, the plant stress adaptation and to the earthly stresses like drought and nitrogen deficiency, but at the same time, some stresses that plants experience in space, like space radiation and microgravity. Um, early, early years of my work during my PhD, I worked with wheat and barley, and I did a lot of omics work and looked at the natural variation in stress response and how um, also different uh, plant species have um, like different genetic variances that affects their seed quality. After, uh, at the end of my PhD, I was really interested in uh, plant microbe interactions and their potential for improving the abiotic stress tolerance. Then I moved to University of Wisconsin Medicine um, to learn about plant microbe interactions. And at that, I had uh, multiple different um, opportunities to look at the association of abiotic stress tolerance and the pl beneficial plant microbe interactions. And my research is funded by different agencies, like coming from the Commodity Grant Montana Wheat and Barley to the NASA grants. And if you want to learn more about my research, you can check my Google Scholar. And um, if you want to learn about my postdoctoral work, which is currently not published, you can also uh, email me or message me from Twitter. But today I want to talk to you about the hidden part of this journey. So I cannot talk about the hidden part of my journey without talking about how I become a scientist and my where I come from. So I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey, and these are my uh, parents, um, my mom and dad, and they both were they both were uh, born in uh, rural Turkey. My mom is from this Black Sea city called Giresun, and my father is from Eastern Turkey, um, and um, they're experience of borning and mostly being raised in rural Turkey really shaped their ability to be able to um, get educated, to have access to education. So both of my parents did not have any college education. Not only that, um, they didn't even have any high school education. And my mom, for instance, after elementary school, she didn't have a chance to go to um, school because there was no school in her village for girls after elementary school. So growing up, um, 
I didn't have anyone around me who had, um, who didn't have a, who had an education after middle school. And this also includes my um, extended family, like including my aunts and uh, uncles. And I heard a lot of stories about how it is important to be able to go to school and how I should appreciate the opportunity that I have to be just uh, get educated. And early on, I, um, I was able to um, show some signs of being a scientist. I was a very curious little kid. Um, and I like starting from middle school, when I started learning about the cells, the biology, I really, really liked molecular biology and I wanted to be a scientist. However, I really had no idea uh, about what the path for being a scientist looked like. So I can say that as a first generation student, of course, there are a lot of other challenges like isolation, um, like, um, like isolation, but I think my biggest challenge was not being able to know where I want to get, uh, like how I want to get where I want to get and not knowing, not knowing the path. Um, and uh, this, of course, caused a lot of struggles. Um, but uh, I think I want to acknowledge that I was also lucky. Um, I was, um, um, I was, uh, I was at, at the right place at the right time, I think, and that really helped my journey, although this is not an ideal situation. Um, then um, in Turkey, we have university entrance exams, so I was able to do well in these exams and got into Istanbul Technical University, which is a, uh, a good university in Turkey, and it's a public university, so I didn't have to pay anything to college education and if I had to I don't know if I would be able to stand here today so I was really lucky to be able to do well in the exam and get into the program that I want um so as I mentioned like just being a first generation college graduate and not being able to have any exposure to um, science as a kid, although I really wanted to, I really care about helping others to find the pet that they want to go and finding an entrance to science. And I think outreach for that is really important. And as a scientist, I really try to take different opportunities to be involved in scientists in science outreach. And this is not only important for increasing the um, increasing the awareness about science, but it's also important to be able to uh, resource for people like little me who really wanted to be a scientist but had no idea how to do that. And I just wanted to um, provide you some resources if you want to be involved in science outreach. Um, first of all, the immediate resources can be your university and your local community. For instance, when I was a PhD student at Montana State University, um, I volunteered for a nonprofit organization and I taught uh, kids at, at elementary school um, through an after school program about plants and sustainability. So definitely check out those opportunities in your local community. But now even there are some opportunities to be involved in science outreach uh, from the comfort of your own uh, couch at home, uh, like websites like Planting Science, Skype a Scientist and Seed Your Future have some opportunities for you to be involved in science and reach out to elementary school students, middle school students and show them yourself as a scientist and be a resource for them. And I highly encourage that. Another part of being an intern, um, being a first generation uh, student and first generation scientist was essentially mentoring. Um, as I mentioned, growing up, I didn't really have much of a resource or mentoring about how to be a scientist. And even in my undergraduate education in Turkey, I found that um, I found it hard to get some mentoring because the teaching world of our um, professors were really hard. So it was really hard to get some mentoring from our student, uh, our um, professors. And in my um, practice today, I, I try to be a resource for, ment for my mentees. And I encourage everyone to talk to talk to different people, undergraduates, uh, about their experience of being a scientist, but not only just like the things that in the lab, but how they become a scientist. Because even in here at University of Wisconsin Medicine, I found out that um, many of the students do not know what a pet to be a scientist looks like. What does it mean to be, get a PhD or what does it mean to be a postdoc? And that being said, I also want to uh, show this other resource to you, the Plantae Mentoring uh, site. 
um, and you can reach it through this link. And this is a great place if you want to be both a mentee or a mentor. Um, so if you are looking for a job or anything, you can find a mentor from this website for yourself. But let's say you are a graduate student and you want to be a resource for people um, like maybe undergraduates or high school students, you can uh, still sign up here as a mentor and be a resource for others. So another hidden part of my um, iceberg is being a woman in, in science. And um, I want to show you that the gender gap in STEM fields is, is still, is still exists and it is still a big problem. Because when I talk about uh, women in science issues, I start hearing that, oh, we made progress. Yes, maybe we did progress, but there is still a lot of space for progress. And this data shows you here that um, despite that, like almost 50% of the U.S. workforce is women now, the STEM workers uh, only count for the 27th, uh, the woman part of STEM workers is only 27%. And if you look at this graph here, maybe you can say that, oh, like in biology, the woman, in, uh, woman scientists uh, compose 50% of the scientists. But what happens is that um, what, what we see in general is that when a woman start climbing the ladders, they fall through. And um, because of that, in the higher positions and in leadership positions in STEM, we still have very little amount of women scientists. And the main reason for this, uh, I believe, is that uh, is the, the, the dilemma that women face between having a child and pursuing a career. If you look at this data, as you see that nearly half of like nearly half of, I really want to emphasize that, half of US female scientists leave the full-time academic science jobs after they have their first child. And as you look at this graph, some of them leave the workforce entirely while this is really not the case for fathers. And this really leaves us, like people like me, early career scientists, with this question of having a baby versus having a career. And because we work in a really highly competitive environments, and uh, for instance, I myself want to pursue an academic career, and then you face with this question of whether I should have a publish or perish, and when, when I will I have the time to have a baby. So this is definitely a struggle for many women in science like myself. And recently I decided that, you know what, I will have my career and my baby. And uh, last year I had my daughter who is now five months old. And this is me when I attended the plant biology conference uh, when I was seven months pregnant. And this being said that I'm still figuring out how to be a mother in uh, in um science and uh, this is definitely a tough journey um, one thing that i uh, immediately learned is that the support that you need be uh, being able to pursue the science that we want to do but at the same time being a mother and um, for instance in university of wisconsin medicine there is no paid parent to leave um, so which would mean that like me immediately going back to work after after having my baby. But my advisors, Jean Michelena and Simon Gilroy, were very supportive and they gave me time off despite there is no paid parental leave at University of Wisconsin Medicine. And and these kind of parental leave issues are the reasons why we see that 50% of workforce leaving the academia after having their first baby. At the same time, like I said, I'm still figuring this out and um and I really like to um, find role models for myself who already did this, who um, achieved, um, who despite all the struggles they had, um, achieved to be a woman in plant science. And as an early career representative of Women in Plant Biology Committee, I started this interview series. Um, we interview women um, from uh, who, are, who have very different stories and uh, post these on Plante website and I highly encourage you to uh, check out this and if you have any woman in plant scientist that you uh, would like to see interviewed please email me and I will try to address that. So wrapping up my talk I want to um, come back to this illusion iceberg illusion and ask, I encourage you to ask yourself, what does your iceberg look like? So I today talked about my own individual story by being an international first generation woman scientist, but it's important to identify what your iceberg looks like and how does that shape 
what kind of a scientist you want to be. And I think, again, it's really important to be a resource for others. And by identifying what our iceberg look like, we can do that. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Optikin, for being here and sharing your story with us and all of your insights. Um, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, so now it is a great privilege for me today to introduce Dr. Gitanjali Yadav. Uh, Dr. Yadav is a scientist at the National Institute of Plant Genome Research in New Delhi and a professor of data science at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Bhopal, India. She is an expert in AI for genomics with applications in food security and conservation. Dr. Yadav is trustee of St. Edmunds College at the University of Cambridge and co-chairs the International Data Policy Committee. She's a strong advocate of open notebook science and has, has been recognized globally for her work and has achieved uh, recognitions such as the INSA Medal, the Bayed Siddiqui Life Science Award, the Yusuf Hamid Award for, from Cambridge, and Exceptional Talent Award from the Royal Society of London. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Yadav, and please join me in welcoming her. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Alice. Springtime greetings to everybody who is tuning in to this channel tonight, today, this morning, wherever you are in the world. At the outset, I take this opportunity to congratulate and compliment the young fellows of Plante who are hosting this event. Thank you so much for celebrating women in plant science. I think that's it's high time we did that again and again. So just a minute. Do you see full screen for me? I suppose. I suppose you do. Yeah, so women in plant science, we form a huge global sisterhood. And I have been a female plant scientist for about 19 years now, 19 years completing next week. And what I find is that across the globe, regardless of, of borders of nationality, discipline, um, you know, institution and any kind of culture, regardless of age, regardless of career stage, our challenges are so common. Interestingly, the strengths that we have, the way we overcome these challenges are also common between all of us, but we won't know it. We won't know it unless we share experiences, increase our connections and build strong platforms like yourself right here at Plante for sustained support. And so thank you once again. I have designed my slides today to go back and forth between my research and my journey. My, my current research focuses on two major themes. One of them, the first, is biodiversity informatics. This is where we are trying to decipher the silent language of plants, or rather the, the variable chemical code that, um, that plants use to communicate with each other and with the entire biosphere. All of life as we know it is complex chemistry in a semi-permeable bag. This was said by Mark Hunter, and I've taken it to heart. I mean, I, I believe it beyond anything else. And this work, the work that I'm doing is important for conservation because my focus or the research focus of my lab is on invasive alien plant species that pose a huge threat to biology, a, a huge threat to biodiversity, essentially. My interest in biodiversity began at a very early stage. I was growing up and of course I had no expectation or anticipation or knowledge of being or becoming a scientist one day. I was born at the military headquarters of war. My dad was constantly traveling and I grew up constantly traveling, often living in distant small towns, mostly in the seven sister states of um, Northeastern India, which is one of the major world's biodiversity hotspots. And being there gave me two opportunities. One was to explore nature. As you can see, I have spent countless hours in the sacred forests of India. And the second opportunity that I got was to discover my love for reading. Of course, we did not have the WWW in those days. God Almighty Google and was not there with us, but we had libraries. I loved the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, but I also loved 
the adventures of Mendel, of Darwin, of Marie Curie. And I did not know, even though I did not know at that time that I could be a scientist myself, I was quite moved by, by the stories of some scientists, you know, and their adventures, like how Newton, for example, felt about light transforming into matter. Um, I, I remember crying, weeping for several nights for the death of the poor French chemist Lavoisier, what the world lost because he was killed at the guillotine. Uh, there was there was a time when I was thinking about, you know, the, the whole story of the Russian Soviet botanist Vavil of his crop gene bank had been saved. That's why we have, you know, we have agriculture being so good today. But at that time, that was the guy Vavilov, that great man himself tragically died of the one thing that he spent his entire life trying to prevent, starvation. He died of starvation, but he didn't let anything happen to the crop gene bank. And that is available to us to use today. I mean, these are these were adventures. These were inspirations that I had when I was growing up. But I need to definitely mention here that I did not find a lot of stories or inspirations or I couldn't find a lot of books on female scientists in the world. Leave alone I mean, leave alone plant female scientists or anyone of my own ethnicity. That is an even smaller number, as you've heard both Thelma and Bursa talk about. So, you know, to be frank, it's not easy to find women in plant science, to find women in science, women in STEM anyway, leave alone their color roles. So I think the invisibility that we have is also because of something that the world is dagged, quote unquote, as the Matilda effect, that there is, the world is trying to make you invisible, but you yourself also do not want to become visible, right? And the only way to change the situation is to tell or share these stories. And that is why I'm grateful to Plante for choosing to do that, to celebrate women in plant science. And here is my list of women in plant science who I dug out and found out about to highlight their work. Did you know about the seven Dutch ladies whose research after the World War I provided vital information about the Dutch elm disease? We know the disease, but we don't know the ladies behind its discovery. Do you know about the lichen experiments of Beatrix Potter? I hope, I'm sure many of you do know, but Whatever you do know is not enough. You should read her autobiography. Did you know Lettuce Digby, who worked with William Bateson in my own department at the Cambridge University Department of Plant Sciences to dissect a curious botanical event with an even curiouser name that I love to work on, and that is polyploidy. We need to continue to tell their stories. We need to continue to tell our stories. And well, that brings me to my other research interest, my second research interest is in understanding how nature has evolved and optimized mechanisms to enhance photosynthetic efficiency, collectively called the carbon concentrating mechanism. And this little guy you see on the street, this huge beast is the unicellular green alga, Chlamydominus rinhartii. The work we are doing for improving photosynthetic efficiency of rubisco in, um, you know, in crop plants through clammy is important to food security because enhanced photosynthetic efficiency translates directly into higher productivity, which in turn becomes greater biomass, which in turn helps us keep a you know, huge and increasing population well fed. And our approach in all of these things that I'm doing is primarily knowledge-based. Uh, there's a lot of interdisciplinary work combining modern tech with traditional methods. I cannot emphasize enough the role that interdisciplinary thinking or transdisciplinary thinking can play in your work. I have personally experienced the amazing benefits of working at the intersection of multiple fields. We do, you know, we use um, high resolution land records from rural India. We use multi-omics visualizations. We use chemistry, physics, fossil records of pollen grains, ancient civilizations, world trade records, geospatial modeling, you name it. We do all sorts of data analytics to address the questions that we are addressing in the lab. And as you may have guessed already, we rely a lot upon machine intelligence. More recently, we've been making use of various transformers and large language models, but it was not always so. I didn't grow up studying this in my education. So I'll roll you back to my education where I studied botany, biomedicine, and bioinformatics in that order. A lot of people who are introducing me to different lectures sometimes find it hard to read what they're reading. And in retrospect, 
I can stand here now and brag about it, flaunt and swag that these decisions were so diverse because, you know, precisely that's what I needed to work on as I do today, chemistry, geography and botany I'm combining in my work and that would help me. But I didn't know it then. And the real reason I chose to study these apparently diverse different subjects was to escape, was to escape being binned into a box. Yes, the world is trying to constantly set you into a tight mold. And I kept choosing to break free, to break free of conventions, to break free of expectations. And so, so for me, this education of mine was more of a rebellion. But at the end of the day today, yes, with the whole range of feathers in my cap and all disciplines, I can say that, you know, it was useful. But you know, precisely for the reason that the molding and the binning into boxes doesn't stop, I would like to specially stop here and congratulate every girl, every woman who is listening to me today, watching this today. Congrats for making the decisions that you made. Congratulations for being where you are today. It couldn't have been easy. Fox might have told you you're making a mistake. Is she kidding herself? Why can't she fall in line? It's okay to not fall in line. The world is forever going to try and bend you and push you into making a decision, whether personal or professional. The things that we do, you know, unwillingly for, for the family, for the children, for peer pressure, for your boss, for the funding agency, the longer you spend time in struggling to fit a mold that you don't belong in, the more you damage yourself emotionally and physically. And so you have to stop doing that immediately. Luckily, we can do this in many ways. Every drop in the ocean counts. Plante fellows are doing it tonight. They're getting us to talk about our stories and share our experiences. In India, there's this program called Gati, which hopes to bring Athena Swan to India under the guidance of a very able man, Dr. Sanjay Mishra. India has several six, I think, city knowledge clusters. They've got many schemes for young women in STEM. I have been part of the Indian National Young Academy of Science where we used to meet and still do meet and mentor girls from remote areas, rural areas. I have co-founded Semantic Climate with my colleague, friend and mentor, Peter Murray Rust at the University of Cambridge. We are a huge global science, citizen science movement, and we are simply trying to bring climate action to your doorstep. Click on the QR code you see on the screen and you can join the Semantic Climate Collective. Our premise is that every school kid, every senior citizen, every local counselor, everybody, farmers, should know how to mediate climate action. And I'm very proud to say that all our program managers and 75% of our tech developers are girls and women. Just because so much is already happening, as you can see on the screen, can we rest in peace that we've done enough? No, I don't think so. Highlighting the sucks, the stories of women can go a long way in creating awareness. And on that particular note, I'm going to talk about this portal, you know, building a sisterhood. I have, um, you know, this is a national compendium of Indian women and girls in STEM that I have helped, of course, to design and implement. It's called Swathi, Science for Women, a tech and innovation portal. It's set up by the Indian government um, for the you know, 75th year of our independence and so on. If you are an Indian and if you have ever studied STEM in India, please join Swathi. You can become Swathi in a matter of minutes, again, with the link or the QR code on the screen. So I'm going to basically close here, but no, not yet. I'm going to ask you, are you the only girl in the room wherever you are? Well, not on my watch. And if there's one thing I can tell my my own, if I can go back in time and tell something to my future, my past self, I would say if you're the only girl in the room, there's something wrong with the room. If you're the only girl on the table, there's something wrong with the table. Let's fix it. Let's bring in others. Let's collectively help each other and go ahead and do things together. I intend, I make it an intention to do so. So there's so much I want, I know I have to close now and there's so much to discuss. Berku and um, Thelma has, have already led, a, you know, put aside, shown us so many challenges that are faced by women in science today. And yet there is so much that remains undiscussed, untalked about. A lot of people, particularly women, have you noticed, they will struggle to ask for help. And I think the reason women struggle to ask for help is because it requires flexing of two specific muscles. And those two specific muscles, women don't use very often. What are those two muscles? One is acknowledging your vulnerability. We are not in the practice of failing publicly. And so we don't 
want to acknowledge that we are vulnerable. And the second muscle that you have is the responsibility aspect. You feel you're imposing on the other person. Oh, she's got, oh, they've got so much on their plate. How can I ask them to help me in addition? Even before you get to asking someone for help, you talk yourself out of it, madam. What you don't realize is that you're depriving somebody else from helping you. And helping you, helping someone is a life juice. It feels so good. Let me help you. There might be somebody else willing to help you. People might be willing and ready to help you. Allow them. Don't talk yourself out of it, okay? I have listed a few other themes here that women don't usually talk about. I think we don't know how to talk about these things. Or maybe we are increasingly afraid to talk about anything. So my message here and my message to Replante is let's have more informal discussions, more fearless discussions and more interviews versus so good, good about that. How do we manage career hopelessness? How to know when it's not your mess to fix? Let's just stop trying to fix everything. How to manage the negativity bias? When you hear 10 good things about yourself and one little bad thing, which one do you remember? You remember that little bad thing because it's so easy to fall into that trap. So my parting message to all of the girls and women listening to us today is that you've got to make it intentional and a positive, you know, you've got to make it intentional to, to listen to good things about yourself. I've written it down on this slide right here. Read it, do it, ingest it, okay? Of course, you need to stop apologizing. That's another thing women do. You enter a room, two minutes late, you will say, sorry. The door bangs a little bit harder, you'll say, sorry. For no reason at all, if the chair creaks, you'll say, sorry. Stop apologizing for yourself. You don't need to do that. Thank you for having me join this panel. It's it's the part that I enjoyed most was wondering what to talk about to all of you and what I might say to you tonight. So please do feel free to get in touch if you want to. Um, I'm here and I want to help and I don't mind, okay? Um, so don't talk yourself out of it. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Yada, and thank you all our speakers uh, that came today with their amazing uh, presentation. Now we will have the Q&A session. Uh, before that, uh, let me introduce myself. I am Isabel Pochet, and I will moderate this session. So remember, if you have any question, you can use the Q&A uh, box in the Zoom app. Uh, you can leave there are the questions, and uh, we will read the question for the uh, speakers, right? So to start, I have some, uh, I have already some questions that uh, I would like to ask uh, to all our speakers, right? So what advice would you give to young women considering a career in science but feeling uh, hesitant about the challenges? I think, oh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, don't tell me, okay. So I was gonna say, um, I think um, one of the things is, um, you know, finding mentors. I cannot emphasize that enough. And, you know, your mentors um, could be near peers, which I think you should have mentors at multiple different ranks and mentors that are near peers, you know, so if you're an undergrad, talking to a grad student, you know, when you're a grad student talking to a postdoc, and then maybe somebody else more senior ranked and having that diversity of people and then learning from them because, you know, we all go through very, very, very similar challenges. And it's really helpful to have somebody who's gone through something to help you navigate it and walk you through it and also then connect you to other people who can help you. And the people who can help you don't necessarily have to be women as well. That's right. And I would like to say, believe in yourself. Your potential depends upon your belief. That's what I would like to say. Thanks. I, I agree with both of those messages. And I also want to say that um, sometimes the journey might be tough. And I think it's important to identify some tools to take care of yourself during that journey and like find community support. It doesn't only have to be like at your university, but finding people to chat about your journey or like go have a coffee or like 
doing something, just like having that community support and like taking care of yourself during that journey is also really important because sometimes challenges will be there, like there will be failures and it's important to get up and continue the way. Thank you very much for your answers. And uh, another question uh, is what initiative have you found most effective in motivating women to pursue a career in science? What, the, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, the no, question is, uh, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, um, what initiatives have you found most effective in motivating women to pursue a career in science? So I'd like to answer that from uh, the perspective of um, India in the Global South, also from the University of Cambridge, where I've spent more than five years, and the Asia Pacific, where I've spent almost 10 years meeting different people. So what I find is that for women in science wanting to initiate a career, there are huge numbers of grants that are available only for women in plant sciences. I also find there are platforms like the diversity plant, the diversity plant science women uh, group uh, that can be very helpful in sharing um, opportunities. Are you on X or LinkedIn or Twitter where you can have a sisterhood where you can share things with each other? In addition, within India, of course, we have the Swati portal. We also have huge initiatives um, by the government of India for women wanting to return to research after a break or uh, wanting to take a break. In addition, there are opportunities like, you know, I was I was wondering um, when I met some women in plant science in Italy, they were talking about not being able to think about having children um, because it will impact their work in India we get two full years of leave um, throughout our career in science if we want to take a break for kids. But if you have a child, you will get, in addition to these two years, you will have six months of maternity leave as well. So there are many opportunities, but quite often, I think the biggest factor that um, prevents people from being able to access these opportunities is a lack of awareness. Um, ignorance, I would say, is not bliss, but there is a lack of awareness. And I think even though we are becoming digital, more digitized, everything available on the internet, still, still, the information doesn't trickle down to the people who need that somehow. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Um, I think, um, like, I, it's really great to hear that there are some countries that has two-year parental leave that definitely doesn't exist in the United States. Um, I want to say that for me in my career, actually finding societies was really helpful um, because sometimes maybe your mentors like or the universities that you are in might not have the resources that you need, but there are some good societies like this one, but there are also some other societies that provide professional development resources um, and looking for those is really important. That being said, also, I agree that there is a... Um, the tools that the, even the society say are not advertised well. So I think it's our job to be able to tell our students or share with other other groups like that these tools are available and, and they can serve them. So I think it's important to make the tools available because I think there are some tools out there, um, but we should make it more available. And, and should I, should I sorry? Are we yeah. out of time? Should I chime in? Yes, please. Okay. So I feel like with any type of initiative, um, it's really important that the initiative is actually catered to the group that you are intending to serve, right? And and one of the things that we fail to do, um, a lot of programs fail to do is actually survey the needs of the people you're trying to help, right? So the challenges that women face are not going to be the same you know, challenges based on demographic groups, right? Within a group, like uh, issues facing black women are not the uh, same as issues that are being faced by other women of overrepresented groups in STEM, right? And so you have to understand the needs of those people. And sometimes you actually have to build your own programs. You have to build your own networks. And again, when you go to X or Twitter, um, you know, those type of resources really, really help. And I also think that initiatives that are so very successful is when you actually have more representation, right? You know, for example, um, you know, 
you know, when programs are designed, if it's nine out of 10 people in the room are male, then we're not going to address the issues that women need. So, you know, sometimes we do need more people um, of that group in the room to have a diversity of ideas. And then we're able to um, make those uh, initiatives more, um, more successful. Thank you. And lastly, we have one last question that I would like to ask myself this question because for me it's very important. And you have been discussing this topic uh, during the webinar. And it's about, apart from maternity leave, what else can institutions do to support uh, mothers in science? Because I, I consider that uh, motherhood have a big impact in our careers as a woman, as well, uh, Dr. Alekin Al uh, talk uh, about that. What, apart from the maternity leave, uh, uh, what other initiatives or benefits can we ask the institution to, uh, to uh, give uh, to mother working on this thing? I'm not a mother, but, um, you know, I've seen, you know, having worked with colleagues who are, and you realize how much of academia is, um, you know, not supportive of the family unit, for example, right? Like having your department seminar series talk at 4 p.m. or 5 p.m., having, um, you know, important dinners, um, you know, networking events that happen after hours and some parents have to go and pick up kids. So I think, you know, maybe having a midday seminar series, for example, like adjusting the work schedule in which everybody can be included and thinking about that and not thinking that, oh, everybody has this flexibility that we can hang out and go out for drinks. And because to be honest, this is true in academia and in business, right? Um, a lot of connections, a lot of deals, a lot of opportunities happen when people are having drinks or after hours and stuff. And and so it sets a lot of people back if you don't participate in those activities. So rescheduling those type of opportunities is important. I'd like to add over here that institutions can also help women um, help change research evaluation processes for women particularly. And this is being done to a large extent um, in India with the Gati program, which was a modulation, as I said in my speech, it was a kind of modulation of the Athena Swan program of the United Kingdom, but better because it actually allows every institution to think about what it is doing to enhance the experience for a woman, for a female um, student, female scientist, as well as a female worker, staff member, communicator, administrative staff, and so on. So there has to be, yes, you're absolutely right. Just giving somebody leave is, is one thing. It can be very useful. I know already, yes, the US doesn't have it. But there is so much more that you can do to make somebody feel better about doing what they're doing. Microaggressions that Bursu was, no, was it? Uh, yeah, it was, it was Thelma who was talking about it. You know, making sure that a, an environment, an enabling environment is created where such microaggressions are noted and not... Uh, appreciated or collectively, you know, talked about. And I think that's that's what institutions can do and that individuals can, it has to be collectives who do that. So more platforms, create platforms for us to talk to each other freely, um, you know, unhurriedly and have conversations. These are very important. Thanks. Um, I also want to add um, a few things that I, I recently became a mother and um, there are also some like practical issues like having a proper lactation room for a mother who wants to breastfeed like maybe having some um free parking near where their building is uh when they are pregnant like these are some really important things and most importantly child care like child care is the reason why many women scientists leave academia because child care in the united states is really expensive and um for instance me as a postdoctoral researcher like it, it it's it's hard to afford the child care so like having more accessible child care for graduate students and early career researchers is really important 
On the top of that, when it comes to, again, childcare, like um, recently, like being a mother, I realized that like my ability to be able to attend conferences immediately decreased because now I have a baby and uh, someone has to take care of her. So like the conferences uh, should provide a space for women um, like a childcare space so they maybe can travel together and they can put their child in the child care and they can attend the conference because this is really important for especially early career scientists. That being said, also providing some maybe travel grants for women to travel with their child because that's another important thing, right? Like maybe we can get some money from the university, from the grants to travel ourselves, but then we also have to buy a ticket for our child and, and afford the child care. So these are just some practical issues, but overall like providing is to pace for women to ex to exist like, as a mother, <laughs> I think is important because even in some of the practical issues that there are some practical issues that I see like before even coming to like the isolation that you feel as a mother um, or the microaggressions. So yeah. yeah. Thank you very much to uh, for your answers. And uh, we are, uh, on time to finish uh, this uh, webinar. Thank you very much to all our speakers, uh, to our moderators, and to Plantai to provide this platform to discuss uh, these very important topics that uh, should be uh, interesting for everybody. So uh, be sure to uh, follow the uh, next Plantai webinars information that uh, Plantai will be uh, posting on the social media and uh, thank you very much, much to everyone who asked questions so thank you we, all goodbye I can hear you Jason thank yeah. You yeah thank you very much for joining us today it's been such an insightful webinar um, and thank you um, for our attendees and above all to our speaker it's been a great space to celebrate phenomenal women in plant biology. And as Isabel said, we hope that we could catch you at our next webinar series. With that, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you on the next one. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks.